Hey guys, what's up? It is week 350 or 364, 354, I believe. Uh, I have some reviews for you. First up is going to be The Sting of Death. This is from Radiance Films. This is actually made in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken, 1990. And if you look at this film, I always say this. This is kind of strange about Japanese cinema to me. Um, I love how they look, but they all look like they could be made from 1960 to 2005. Like they all have this very similar kind of style and look to them, except unless when they're talking about direct to video stuff, and then obviously it looks a little cheaper. But as far as this one is concerned i would have guessed this was older but that's probably because it's a period piece film too so essentially what happens is this is right after world war ii and we have this husband who's had an affair and his wife distrusts him completely for obvious reasons and he still sees the woman who has had an affair and it this is i don't really know how to break down the plot of this movie necessarily but this is definitely just kind of a mood piece it's it's slow moving it's morose it looks so cold and so sad and so damp and it's just kind of like uh, the definition of a couple sitting in silence when there's something horribly wrong and nobody says anything. You know, uh, it's just it's just unbearable silence. A lot of this film is. So it's a, the husband and wife have two kids as well, and the woman starts to lose her mind. And the husband pretty much tries to do everything he can. They threaten to leave. There's violent fights. And there's a lot of quietness, a lot of, like, uh, you know, morose, like I said. But then there's these sudden bursts of anger or violence. Um, I guess you'd put it with something like, um, you know, another kind of, I, I don't want to say that. That's kind of just ob obvious and on the nose, a woman under the influence. But, you know what I mean? Just this kind of uh, woman who is, is having these horrible issues with her husband. It, it's, it's very much just that kind of... Uh, drama in that aspect but the way it's shot the way it looks is gorgeous and it's funny how one person can drive another person completely mad or do it in solidarity because of guilt um so there's all that going on in here as far as the special features are concerned we have um, a newly, uh, we have documentary on the Japanese film Renaissance of the 1990s featuring interviews with Koji Aguri, uh, Kishiyoshi Kurosawa, Kaneto Shindo, and others. Interview with film scholar Hideko Madia, newly translated English subtitles, versatile sleeve featuring designs based on original posters. Um, the lead actor in this movie, you'll recognize him from a slew of things. Uh, he's in Survive Style 5, he's in 13 Assassins. He's pretty much one of the premier Japanese actors. He's excellent, he's great in this too. A uh, completely different role. I usually see him play more of the comical role this one he's a little bit more serious a little bit more kind of um uh, just depressed as he should be but yeah this is a really well made film and I think that visually it's 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 probably the strongest point is the visualization of everything looks gorgeous in the most depressing way if that makes any sense sting of death okay the next one here is kind of strange one this is called the black mass and this is by Devani Pin um, so this is weird I really did not know what to expect so I put this in it's from MVD visual and I was like okay so we have a serial killer film and it took me a minute before I realized what this is what this movie is, is essentially the rampage that Ted Bundy did when he escaped prison and went down uh, the sorority row and massacred all the uh, sorority girls. So that's basically just that point from that time he escapes to that to a set of murders. Uh, there's some familiar faces in here for people that watch a lot of uh, independent cinema, including... Um, where is she here? She's not even credited on the cover, but um, she's in a bunch of Richard Griffin's movies, Sarah Nicklin. Maybe she's got an alternate name. She's a really excellent actress. But as far as other people, you have Jeremy London and Aline Dietz from The Exorcist, Lou Temple, kind of the bigger names in here, Lisa Wilcox. I mean, people know them from horror movies. But uh, it was nice seeing Sarah Nicklin in here. So essentially, it's strange because it's not exactly point of view in the Maniac remake style. It's kind of weird. So you see like from his kind of walking and his interactions, but you do get a psychology of the killer. You get how um i guess uh, fragile his masculinity is how fragile his ego is and all that plays into who he uh, attacks and his victims you know ted bundy was a horrible horrible person and unlike uh and, and this one portrays him as kind of an, uh, a gross monster as he was um there is of course a rape scene in here uh, which is unpleasant as hell to watch and in fact a lot of this movie is completely unpleasant um, the violence is effective though I, I can't lie when I say wow this really kind of was bothersome in, in a lot of ways in comparison to some of the you know, newer horror films that come out and a lot of them do have guts like Terrifier 2 but I, I don't want to say this is guts but you know when they're tackling a serious subject matter it's really 
hard to do and i don't know how you even do it anymore when it's something fresh um as far as serial killers are concerned i feel like that's just kind of one of those things that everybody does it's just like whatever i know in uh, the manson family murders uh jim van weber said i just followed the crime scene photos because that's all i could trust um and, and this one I, I do think it, it fo follows the killer around and, and the victims. The victims really aren't that big of characters. They're kind of just, I wouldn't say cookie cutter, um, but they're not huge, uh, you know, plot points. I mean, we and in fact, you only get to see Bundy in his kind of manic state being frustrated and trying to be charming, but he always looks like a drooling dog at points in the background. Overall, this is probably better than I would expect if you told me they're going to do a Ted Bundy movie from that time period, from just that small time frame, and it was a new kind of independent film. I'd be like, I don't know what we're going to get out of that. Uh, this one actually uh, didn't really pull many punches, and I think that's kind of a one-way approach that you have to do it. If you're going to be brutal and show a killer for being a monster, you, you can't really pull your punches. There's other aspects and other ways to go about it, too. Um, Henry is my favorite serial killer movie, and although they didn't have the entire story when they did it, I think that they portrayed uh, that life, and, and, and some people would say sympathetic, more sympathetic than it should have been, but I think that it was portrayed in such a... In such a in, um, in, in, I guess enticing way unfortunately if you would say that those terms I guess interesting I always thought Henry was just interesting and done in a very documentary style thing so it always worked really well um so like I would compare this you know that Bundy movie that came out with Zac Efron and this is the complete opposite of that although that movie kind of lost its its punch when you realize that he's Ted Bundy right off the bat it kind of loses its punch but uh the black mass I would say uh if, if you're bothered by you know rape and serial killer stuff then steer clear but if you think you can handle it and you're interested in that kind of stuff then check out the black mass uh I, I didn't think it was too bad actually I was I was kind of a little uh impressed with it for what it was you know I didn't expect much but yeah there's no real features on here trailer and and image slideshow. All right, the next one here is one of my favorites, and this is The Church by Michele Suave, 1989 classic. Michele Suave did Stage Fright, The Church, The Second, of course, Cemetery Man. Seven films put out three of his films on 4K recently, so we're checking out The Church. Watched this on Blu-ray not too long ago. Seen it a dozen times. Love this film. So, uh, beautiful uh, soundtrack also included on here by Keith Emerson, who did Inferno, and, of course, Goblin, who did a bunch of Dario films, Dawn of the Dead as well. But uh, The Church, so this is a.k.a. Demons 3. It's not really a sequel to Demons Demons 3. It's kind of an unofficial sequel, as you would see, like Ogre Demons 3 by Lombardo Bava. The TV film is considered an unofficial sequel, or Black Demons by Umberto Lenzi. But then also some people consider this a, a more true sequel, as well as the sec being part 4, and even sometimes people say Cemetery. Oh, what? No, the number 5 would be what, like, Luigi Cazzi's Black Cat, and then number 6 is the Mask of Satan remake, or whatever. So, so it gets weird. It, it gets kind of strange what is considered a Demons film. But, so this is The Church, a.k.a. Demons 3. So what we have here is we have this church that uh, a group of people were massacred in medieval times by, you know, kind of these uh, pre-Nazis is what they would call them. They butchered this entire village and they threw them in this hole and built a church above it. Now it's modern day and we're in this church um, and that's kind of where we pick up. But I love the opening and I mentioned this before because in the very beginning we see these innocent people just kind of trying to live their lives and this, this kind of crusaders come in and they start massacring everyone and you're like, oh, that's horrible. It's like this big uh, statement on Catholicism. But then at the very next second uh, they actually start turning it to demons. They're like, what to believe? What to believe? Um, as it goes on, we get to the, the modern day, and of course, they're remodeling this church because it's falling to pieces. We have a lot of historians in there, including Thomas uh, Arnana, who's the librarian. We also have, I can't remember the lead actress's name, but there's a bunch of priests in here, including Giovanni Lombardo Radici, Hugh Corsi from Nightbreed, and um, Highlander. Uh, we have uh, Fiador, uh, I can't think of his last name. He pops up in one of the Emmanuel movies. He's this very old priest in here. Uh, some other familiar faces. I know there's some other ones popping up in the background here that you guys would recognize from Italian cinema but essentially what happens is while they're screwing with this church um, the demon kind of possesses Thomas Arnana and he becomes like this goat like creature Satan's kind of inside of him and as it, uh, as it gets worse and worse, everybody gets trapped in their church where they're remodeling because they trigger something. And it's kind of like this, I guess you'd say, lament configuration, right? Where it starts changing and forming. It's this kind of uh, you know, automaton, automaton thing, or, or basically, you know, I wouldn't say it's automaton, but it's all cycled to kind of do these booby traps and the church starts closing. The people that get trapped in there are like an old couple, a group of kids checking out the church on a school trip, um, a wedding party and photographers there because they're taking photos in the church. So all these people are trapped in here a motorcycle 
guy and his girlfriend and they're all going to try to get out of this church before they become overtaken by this evil um and the church again is set to when this is triggered to close down so no one can get out um aja argento is also in here it's got to be one of her first roles and she obviously is the key to escaping but uh yeah this movie has amazing special effects every little detail about it is wonderful the way the set moves the way the set's designed like paint uh, paintings on the walls will kind of fade away and there'll be another painting underneath just everything is so articulate everything is uh, it's so attention to detail is immaculate in the church um i love the effects i love the deaths in here they're so wonderful they are on par with dario's deaths you know when we have the the woman who has dropped her glasses that whole elaborate scene and you have the beautiful pulse pounding music it's it's a wonderful score and then we have weird demon sex or or whatever and we have this crazy kind of church sec at the very end uh yeah it's just an excellent movie it's everything you would want for uh, i think i prefer this one over demons 2 i not demons 1 i don't think i can go that far but i think i prefer the church over demons 2 as i get older um it's just got a lot going for it it starts right off the bat there's an amazing train sequence i won't spoil that but it's just it's beautiful ma uh yeah i, I would really recommend this movie if you've never seen the church by michele suave the 4k looks and sounds fucking excellent um, on the first disc, all we have is the trailer and the UHD. Then the Blu-ray, we have an interview with director Michele Suave, interview with producer Dario Gento, interview with co-screenwriter Franco Fernini, interview with Dardano Sacchetti, interview with Aja Argento, interview with Antonio Vitali, interview with actor Thomas Arana, and that was a pretty good one, um, interview with Giovanni Lombardo Medici, RIP, interview with special effects artist Sergio Stivaletti, uh, interview with uh, makeup artist Franco Casanelli, uh, building up the church interview with set designer Antonio Gialog, uh, right hand man interview with assistant director Claudio Letizani, La La um, Return of the Land of the Demons interview with Alan Jones, author of Profondo Argento. Yes, and then we have a soundtrack. This thing is loaded, highly recommended. If you love the church, if you love Michele Suave, if you love Dario movies or demons or something, check this one out. You will not be disappointed. Great stuff. Okay, the next up here is by Ken Russell, and I wanted the full Blair of the White Worm with Gothic from 1986. Now, this is basically the story of Lord Byron, you know, uh, Shyla Shelley, Mary Shelley, and I can't remember the other couple people there, but it is kind of the, the story, the, the party or the get-together that is kind of turned into how Frankenstein was written, the, basically the pre-Frankenstein. After this party, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, the story, the probably the greatest horror novel ever told ever written um so essentially this is really weird and it's done by ken russell so you know it's going to be really bizarre really highly sexualized really just a, a fever dream nightmare like only he could make this a, a fall a, a balls out horror film so uh the cast includes gabriel byrne excellent in here natasha uh, richardson we also have timothy spall who's in dream demon and of course the harry potter films and we have uh r.i.p we have julian sands which is very unfortunate um which sucks uh, that he recently just passed away. I realized that this camera wasn't on, so there's going to be me looking over this way. Oh, well, I think you guys will live. But uh, anyways, uh, so so the story of Gothic is, it kind of really starts off really kind of nice and, and kind of quirky and playful right off the bat. So there's somebody kind of spying on them doing a tour, and this says, look towards the top window. Then we're in the building, and we realize that a bunch of guests are coming to Lord Byron. Lord Byron is a very bizarre individual. Gabriel Byrne just doesn't seem to have much of a soul, doesn't have much empathy for people. People. And as it goes on, we kind of have this thing of mass hysteria where all of them are telling ghost stories and it kind of like becomes this mass hysteria kind of deal where their inner demons become... I guess, to them, real-life uh, amalgamations and start attacking them, and all sorts of weird things happen. People have all these kind of frightful things come to mind, and they're just dealing with all their issues, and it gets really crazy, really bizarre. You have eyeballs and nipples. You have... Uh, doctors trying to commit suicide because there are other hidden homosexuality all sorts of bizarre things and everybody wants to sleep with gabriel byrne or he wants to sleep with them it's very frankfurter of him if that makes any sense um you get to see julian sands running through the rain on a roof naked um <laughs> julian sands appears naked in almost everything doesn't he that he's in i remember warlock too but uh you know i i this is the first time watch for me and watching it i really enjoyed it i thought it was pretty crazy pretty unique uh would definitely revisit would definitely want to check this and layer the white worm out a bunch more times i think that they're really entertaining really bizarre really kind of you know something that will screw with your mind i wish i would have saw this one again 10 years ago as well but that's gothic as far as the features are concerned audio commentary with Lise, uh, leslie russell 
um, in conversion with Film Story and Matthew Media. In isolated score, audio interview with composer Thomas Dolby, featurettes to Sol Shelley with actor Julian Sands, Fear Itself with screenwriter Stephen Volk on a rainy night with director of photography Mike Southon. So yeah, it uh, looks pretty good and sounds good. Uh, really bizarre, strange movie. And uh, I really enjoyed it because I am a fan of Frankenstein. Okay, the next one up is one of my all-time favorite movies. And this is one of these ones that like is not beloved. I saw it, I didn't know, it's one of the ones that you see before everyone tells you it's a piece of crap, so then when you see it, you're like, oh, I love that movie, and everybody's like, oh, the critics hated it, I'm like, I guess I didn't care because I was nine, but this is one that I originally caught on television and, and ended up renting or buying the VHS and, and just falling in love with it. This is Things That Do Endeavor When You're Dead from 1995. Now, this comes out, and I have to say it because everybody brings it up, this came out right after Pulp Fiction. So everybody compared it to Pulp Fiction on Fairly, and, and it just got, got it shit on. It's the style. Everybody's like, oh, it's a ripoff of Pulp Fiction. That's not really true, especially if you look back. I think that people would not call it that. But as far as the cast is concerned, we have an excellent cast here. We have Andy Garcia. We have Christopher Lloyd, Treat Williams, William Forsythe, Bill Nunn, uh, Bill Cobbs, Jack Warden, uh, Christopher Walken, Steve Buscemi, Glenn Plummer, Don Cheadle, Tom Lister. Who else is in this thing? Marshall Bell. Um, Don Stark, uh, Gabriel Antoine, uh, Frazuka Bulk. Like, can I keep, I could probably keep going on if I really, really, really thought about it. It's just an amazing cast here. Um, everybody is top notch in peak form. So essentially what we have here is Andy Garcia is used a former gangster named Jimmy the Saint. Jimmy the Saint from Flatbush. Um, and he gets called in by Christopher Walken to perform one more job. He can't refuse him. Walken is a paraplegic, um, a quadriplegic actually, not a paraplegic, um, paralyzed from the neck down. And essentially what happens is he tells him he has to carry out this job. He can assemble a crew. He gets his old boys back together, and that's like Treat Williams, Christopher Lloyd, Bill Nunn, and uh, uh, William Forsythe. They're all buddies of his. They don't always get along, though. So he gets all these guys from different walks of life. They're kind of a weird ragtag group of people, and they're supposed to carry on this job to basically scare this guy or beat the shit out of this guy from trying to marry uh Walken's uh once his son's once girlfriend now his son has kind of gone off the deep end since he left her he's he's kind of become like a weird pedophile kind of creep uh just mentally challenged kind of guy so they want to bring him back and and essentially kind of you know scare this guy and beat the shit out of him until maybe Bernard can get his girl back and maybe everything can be okay that's Walken's plan. Walken is hilarious in this movie, and he's horribly violent and horribly just an overall piece of shit. But he's very funny. He's got some great lines. In return for your life, you can suck my dead dick. Take my dead dick out. You know, he's just got good stuff. I'm going to do the Walken impersonation because I'm, I'm trash, okay? But uh, I just love this film. They all got their own little kind of colloquialisms because they're like, they uh, the writer and director were talking about this. They said basically like prison talk, you know, boat drinks because you put your hand against the glass. That's how they shake hands. All these things. Buckwheats is just a really terrible way to kill somebody. But uh, it's incredibly violent. Uh, and I think that there's some really in, insane things in the movie. Um I think that Treat William shines re really well. I think that he is just this weird comical presence that is insane and scary, just a time bomb. Critical Bill, I think he's excellent in this movie. Uh, Bill Nunn has one of my favorite lines in here. It's like summer vacation, man. You wait for it your whole life, and it's gone in a, in a, in a blank or something like that. He says that. I love that walk. I mean, I've, Lloyd's got great lines, and, and Foresight's got that growly voice. Um, this is just an overall excellent movie. Um, I just, I personally love it, um, and at the end, it's really different depressing uh with jimmy just saying his big speeches at the end so he basically in this film he runs a business where you kind of you're dying you record all your wishes to talk to your family your kids your grandkids and tell them things right and it's funny because there's a there's a hit on all these guys and and jimmy the saint's telling all this advice at the very end and throughout the movie and all these things and everybody's telling these advice and then you finally get to hear jimmy the saint's advice at the very end um and jack warden in here is just uh, an amazing presence too if you've seen him 12 angry mad and dirty work he is just absolutely hilarious he delivers um basically you know uh perfectly he's just perfect for this role he's always hanging out in the malt shop with bill cobbs who runs it and he's always telling the stories to these all telling the stories to us and it's basically a big exposition dump but it's a really clever way to get the exposition dump out there for us and the other people in the movie it's just overall i love this fucking thing um 
And I love the characters. I love the actors. It's a great ensemble cast, and everybody delivers on the goods. I love how it looks. I love the soundtrack. I love the score. The score is great too. The actual worst song in the. I, somebody loves the Warren Zevon song. Things to do in Denver when you're dead. I think it's the worst song in the movie. Probably. I it just doesn't fit, and I never noticed it in the credits, and it's on the the menu, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? And I love Werewolves of uh, London, but you know, overall, I thought this was a great release too. I'm um, very happy to finally have this on Blu-ray. This is an imprint. Um, uh, import. Uh, so here's what we have as far as features. Interview with screenwriter, interview with director, interview with actor, Andy Garcia, interview with production designer. So that's really cool. Um, love this movie. I really recommend it. It's one of those Miramax ones. If you've never seen Things to Do in Denver and you're dead and you like 90s crime films, I know you, I know you guys do because 90s crime films were excellent. 70s crime films were excellent. Um, but yeah, this one is I love it. I know a lot of people won't but give it a shot. Jimmy DeSaint. Boat Drinks. Uh, you know, this one is also very special to me and, and me and one of my friends. We watch it so many freaking times that if I were just to say to him, boat drinks or you are Godzilla and I am Japan, or you, I am Godzilla and you are Japan, he'd get that right away. Just a little piece. Uh, love this movie anyways. Things to do in Denver when you're dead. Okay, the next one is going to be very brief. I just checked this out because it was getting a lot of hype and we were going to a, a party that was themed this. And this is Saltburn. So this is a new film by the director of Promising Young Woman, which I loved. I loved that movie to death. I didn't know it was directed by her until I was finished with it. So I'm watching this and I'm like, this is, it looks gorgeous. It's shot in a, in a full screen, which is really bizarre. It's made in full screen. It looks like a gorgeous film and we're basically following this kind of prestige college with highly intelligent people. I can't think of the actor's name. He's the actor from Killing of a Sacred Deer. In fact, the acting is all really strong in here. Richard Richard uh, Grant, excellent here. He's the actor that I know the most, probably, because Hudson Hawk and Gosford Park and a million other movies. But uh, essentially, as this one goes on, what we learn is that our main character here is a narration, so it's kind of sandwiched in narration here. Our lead character is kind of nerdy, kind of poor, has had a tragic background, and he kind of befriends this prince, essentially. And this guy is beloved by everyone, and they become best friends. And he takes him back for summer break to his castle with his family. And some secrets are kind of let out some more things are there some connections and and then we have kind of almost a gothic kind of style twist in this it's a gorgeous looking film it's well acted there's a couple infamous gross out scenes that people are talking about non-stop kind of overshadowed the entire film um i think overall it's a pretty good film it's good uh, i don't love it like everybody else but i would recommend it i think promising young woman is a masterpiece for me at least this one i think is good i think it's fine um i think that a lot of people will enjoy this and i don't see anything truly wrong with it i thought the dance sequence at the end just felt a little forced and i understand i guess why they did it just for shock value it just felt forced it didn't feel really needed but i get it um overall uh salt burn it's okay i liked it it's good stuff okay we're gonna hop into those 1981 movies woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell because through that gateway evil will invade the world
say on a Valentine's Day is a curse that'll live on and on. And no one will know as the years come and go of the horror from long time ago. In this little town, when the 14th comes round, there's a silence and fear in the air. Remember the morn that the legend was born, all the shock and the horror was there. Or oh, the legend they say on a Valentine's Day is a curse that'll live on and on. And no one will know as the years come and go of the horror from long time ago. And no one will know as the years come and go of the horror from long time ago. Okay, this one's not necessarily horror, but I wanted to cover it anyways because it had been years, and this is 1981's Fantasy Sword and Sandal Clash of the Titans. That's right. Clash of the fucking Titans, man. This is one that I watched on loop as a kid. I love the Ray Harryhausen stop motion effects. I love the the Greek mythology, the mythology, you know, that kind of stuff like that. Um, I just loved all that kind of stuff growing up. Although my Greek mythology is pretty poor now, I, I probably knew more when I was younger. I don't. I, I was never an expert. I'll tell you that much. But so essentially, what we have here is. Um, Zeus has this, there's this uh, god, I don't remember which god it is, goddess, and she has, and uh, Maggie Smith, actually, it's played by Maggie Smith, and her son is a tyrant, he's horrible, and he is half, uh, you know, half human, half god, and he does all these awful things, so Zeus punishes him, he turns him into a monster, he looks horrible, so essentially, uh, Maggie Smith is upset at this, and takes Zeus's son, and throws him into a weird area where he must fend for himself, and um, this leads to him kind of stepping up to uh, Maggie Smith's son and essentially pl planning to marry the uh, daughter that will rule uh, the, so he can rule this whole kingdom. Because that's who uh, Maggie Smith's, uh, what was his name, Clysos was supposed to marry and they were supposed to rule in this kingdom together. But this upsets Maggie Smith and now she is going to sacrifice this woman because she can't put her hands on Zeus's kid but she can mess with the ones he loves. So they're going to release the Kraken. So they basically have to get a bunch of things to stop the Kraken. I don't want to spoil absolutely everything, but you'll see appearances by a Kraken a couple times, stop motion, some old witches, um, Medusa, fucking Medusa. That scene is horrifying. That scene is awesome. And it's funny because this is not listed as a horror film, but you have legit horrific scenes of like Medusa turning people into stone, the Kraken rising up, the creature uh, who basically has been turned to a monster. He looks fucking awesome too um overall this is a really good film it's a very fun film it's very memorable it's very very much made past its time you know it's a movie that was kind of the last to the stop motion jason of the argonauts and the uh, sinbad trilogy but it's a really fun movie and i'm glad it exists i i can't say it's an amazing movie but i like it it's a fantasy adventure kind of epic kind of film um and i love the crack and i love medusa i love the monsters in it i've always remembered them overall this is a it's a cool film it's a it's a, it's definitely a timepiece. I forgot it was 1981. I would have watched it sooner, but uh, yeah, it's actually uh, dated for when it was made. But I, I love Clash of the Titans. I, I hope you guys do like this one. And if you've never seen Clash of the Titans, check it out. I've never watched the remake or the sequel to the remake, but yeah, I love this one. Grew up with it, and it held up. It held up for me. I wasn't sure what it would what it would be like, but I enjoyed it for the most part. Okay, the next one here is basically the Indian Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. It's called uh, Sh uh, Shira P. Shira, a.k.a. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This thing is two hours and 20 minutes long. So that's a very long movie. I'm not trying to complain about runtime because we know this. There's only like three or four musical numbers, which is crazy. I don't even think the Robert Louis Stevens book, novel, novella or whatever would translate to two hours and 20 minutes if you were to read it out loud. So essentially what we have here is a good-hearted scientist, and I can't remember, his Wilson, and he's obviously 
obviously trying to develop the serum to basically separate the evil and good from man so the man could be 100% good eliminate his evil tendencies in the very beginning he is constantly he's going to marry this woman named Diana she's a very lovely woman her father is a colonel he had to get permission and through his work his work his research all these kind of things keep taking him to a side and he, he basically is just ruining his chances with marriage because of this he's ruining his life and uh, essentially his experiments get out of hand and he notices that he has this attraction to this other woman this uh kind of i guess you'd say like this dancing woman who's who gives like she obviously might be a prostitute in this world um he has a thing for her and she almost seduces him when he's a normal man so he decides to take the serum when he's he thinks he's perfected it and what he turns it into is of course hi this angry uh person who follows through on their impulses who's incredibly strong and hairy and has this weird hairline but essentially what happens is it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, except a little longer than usual and hyper-focuses on the prostitute storyline. Instead of him attacking people at night like Jack the Ripper, it's more so him just essentially just focusing on this prostitute and all these kind of things. And as it goes on and on, he registers he can no longer control uh, when Hyde and Jekyll come. It's not just the, the serum that does it. It's actually, it's actually at times just the thought of violence, which I don't remember if that's in the novella or not. But overall, this is a decent one, and it, it picks up at the end. It, it turns into a straight hunchback of Notre Dame, Dr. Jekyll, a classic universal where everybody's after him, right? And, uh, you know, he's running around and he's fighting everybody. He's throwing acid on people and he's hitting people, all these kind of things. There's a subplot here where we have this blind man and his, his daughter, his, his sister, who get involved with uh, Mr. Hyde as well. Um, so the kill count's not incredibly high until the very ending, and then, of course, it's going to be tragic. Overall, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde Indian version, not bad, not amazing. I, I liked it. I think that Hotel from India is a little bit better this year, which is also really long, but I think I like that one better. I think it was kind of more of a full GS ghost story. This one's still good, though, and uh, there's two Dr. Jekyll movies from this year, Dr. Jekyll's Sister Os or uh, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Osborne. I can't remember. Miss Osborne. And then, of course, this one. And last year, we had two as well. We had, of course, Dr. Heckle and Mr. Hype, and then the BBC Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with David Hemmings. So, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, two years in a row, two movies. Pretty wild. Okay, the next one up is the Patreon pick, and I forgot to do this last last drawing, and it's Labyrinth. I'm sorry, whoever. I, I completely forgot about it. I think it was Eau Claire. 1986, The Labyrinth. Yes, the Jim Henson kind of team made this movie uh, with David Bowie and Jennifer Conley and voices of Frank Oz and a bunch of other people. So, the Labyrinth, what can I say? It's an absolute classic. It's a fantasy kind of amazing film. Uh, weird that uh, Gothic also is a crazy weird fantasy Gothic film from 1986. And we also have The Labyrinth here. And we also have Clash of Titans from 81. So we're doing a lot of fantasy kind of weird shit going on this time around. But uh, essentially The Labyrinth is as follows. Jennifer Connelly has to watch her infant a brother. And she gets mad about it. And she says uh, she reads him a terrible story and wishes that he would be taken away to, from the Goblin King. Enter David Bowie and his minions of goblins they kidnap uh jennifer Connelly's little brother take him to the goblin kingdom i imagine it's called the goblin kingdom because i think everything in here is like the goblin king the goblin kingdom the goblins so essentially what happens is she goes in there to try to figure it out and throughout the entire film she picks up a ragtag group of people including a big monster this kind of grouchy guy who's like spraying fairies in the very beginning a dog and a, a very tough fight fox who has no sense of smell who reminds me very much of the gay fox from meet the feebles coincidence peter jackson so essentially this ragtag group of people got to stand up against david bowie and his army of minions and goblins they have to go through all sorts of silly mazes and and solve silly puzzles and avoid the uh what is it the uh the <laughs> the uh it's just the stench bog the bog of stench the eternal stench or something like that it's an overall adorable cute movie uh bowie's great in it too the music's great in it very memorable you remind me of the babe what babe the babe with the power um who do you do of course everybody remembers all that stuff the goblins are fucking excellent it's jim henson guys just if you've ever wanted to see so many ghouly muppets in your life shout out exploding heads then you come to the right place the labyrinth is is the ghouly muppet movie there's more ghouly muppets than you could shake a stick at but uh yeah they're great puppets it's very fun the music is great it's very imaginative the sets are wonderful i don't know what the hell you guys want me to say about the labyrinth that's negative because i don't really have one i think it's a really fun movie i think jennifer Connelly's excellent too a year after phenomenon so she She's right on the, you know, in the weird kind of world already. But uh, I, I just would highly recommend this, especially if you have younger brother, sister, or kids or something. Show them the labyrinth. I think they'll enjoy it. The puppets are excellent. Um, the sets are great. The imagination is great. The hard work is there. Overall, it's very cute. And at the very end, I love the message, right? 
Never grow up 100%. Never lose your imagination. It's so touching. I was sitting there watching that, and I just was thinking, man, that's such a touching thing. And don't let the world beat you up. Don't let the world take your imagination. We all need some fun. We all need some fantasy. We all need some imagination sometimes. And, and that's what the labyrinth's all about, right? We need some adventure. So check it out. It's great stuff. Okay, guys, let's get these questions, comments, concerns. Ken Coakley, I forgot to comment about the Swiss conspiracy. You said you were unfamiliar with David Jansen's body of work. Jansen was primarily a television actor who made it big by playing the title character on the TV show called Richard Diamond, Private Eye. Then a couple years later was the title character on The Fugitive as Richard uh, Kimball, a role that Harrison Ford would play in the film version years later. He made a few films, notably The Green Berets with John Wayne. Antron Drifton was also in The Swiss Conspiracy. My favorite Antron Drifton film was Circus of Horrors. Yeah, I mentioned him. Antron Drifton's great in a lot of good movies. The Man Who Could Cheat Death, um, The Beast Who Must Die. A couple more things about Southern Comfort. Up until recently, I thought the film was directed by John Borman, but Walter Hill, like George Romero, likes using the same actors, such as Keith Carradine, who was also in The Long Riders, along with his two brothers, which I loved, especially getting real brothers to play brothers. I saw Keith recently on Fear the Walking Dead, and he was good on the show. Brian James did 48 Hours with Hill. That movie cap, uh, catapulted Eddie Murphy's career. In Southern Comfort, Brian James sounds like he's saying the same thing every time he speaks French. Now on to Fear is the Key, starring fellow Massachusetts native and Celtics fan Barry Newman. He also starred in Vanishing Point. I also remember him being in Bowfinger and Eddie Murphy and Steve Martin. Wisty Martin. He died last year at the age of 92. Dolph Sweet, who appeared in two movies I loved, The Wanderers, in which he played a main character's gangster father. It came out in 1979, but was banned until The Warriors. Ban but got banned with The Warriors because it considered to be a gang film. But it was the coming-of-age drama set in 1963. Sweet also played Sylvester Stallone's father in Lords of the Flashbush. I saw Fear is the Key at the Drive-In with Death Wish 74. Great. The author of the book, Alistair McLean, I started writing stories in high school, and Alistair McLean was my main influence. I read all his books throughout high school and was blown away by his writing style. I always called him gentleman style of writer. No sex, no extreme violence, not even profanity. My last year of high school, I wrote a series of stories with the same characters. I did the first one for my English assignment, and the teacher wanted me to write more, and I did. One story every month for extra credit. Nice. Hudson. Vanishing Point is another good car chase movie with Barry Newman. Alistair McLean wrote more books than I've had hot dinners. Force Tend to Never On, Puppet on a Chain, Break Heart Pass. Uh, Ice Station Zebra, Bear Island, The Satan Bug, When Eight Bells Toll, River of Death, and many, many more. He was a Stephen King for adventure thriller. Good stuff, Dave. Thank you. Uh, Zombie Adams, yet uh, another great episode, Dave. Thank you. Seiko Dan, how does the bloke not have 2,000... K subscribers. Loved your videos for over a decade. I don't know, man. I'm just not good enough. Uh, Jay Wolf, not gonna lie. Uh, I saw the thumbnail for this one. Mistook you for Freddie Mercury for a moment. Okay. I started a joke. Nice gains, brother. Thank you. Uh... Incarnate, uh, even though the sun is not out, I see your guns are. The Nick Mua from Belgium. Mr. Russell's Lair of the White Room looks interesting, very interesting indeed. I dislike the term guilty pleasure. You either enjoy a film or not. Some film critics come out a little snotty. Maybe that comes with the territory after a while, except with you, of course, Mr. Burka. I don't think you have a snotty bone in your body, except my nose, but no bone in that. What's your favorite Ken Russell film? What's your least favorite? Uh, my favorite is probably The Devils. My least favorite, I guess, would be... Do I like Altered States? Or I've only seen a handful. Trapped Ashes, he, his segment, and that's not very good. Don't you wish Warner would just release the unedited cut of The Devils already? Decades later, it surely won't consider it offensive anymore. Yes, I do. Are you excited at all of Robert Eggers' upcoming Nosferatu remake? I'm sure it'll be good. He always does a good job. I hope those side effects have stopped and that you're on your way to full recovery. But if you feel yourself, go Mr. Hyde. Let us know. Seriously, take care. Thank you. Zach Nolan. Always wondered what Ken Russell's other movies were like based on my love for Altered States. Keep going, man. Your obvious passion has been very inspiring to me through the past decade. Hope you watch the 4K of Haunting at Julius soon. There is something about the movie that has resonated with me through dark times. It's probably the most atmospheric film with the best soundtrack as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Stephen Hyde. It makes me happy to see you thriving. I hope you feel so much better soon, buddy. Thank you. Eddie Daniels. You reckon me so many movies, interesting films over the years. I hope you're doing well. You look great. Thanks, everybody. I really needed that. I know you guys could see I'm gone now. I'm like fishing for just niceness and niceties. But anyways, I appreciate it, guys. Uh, let's get into the update. All right, let's hop into this update. First up is the Blu-ray of Dracula, Prisoner of Frankenstein by Jess Franco. Looks like Howard Vernon's in that bad boy. I've actually never seen this one. Always wanted to. Never really had a United States Blu-ray, but here we go. Finally, I'm sure it looks gorgeous with a bunch of features. I like a lot of Jess Franco stuff, so no shame there. And then we have Burial Ground on 4K, Knights of Terror. This movie's insane, 1981, ridiculous. Uh, very much just an oddity of a film. Part goofy, part scary, part gross. It's got it all, man. Burial Ground, great stuff. I love that cover art, too. That, that poster's embedded in my head forever. It was a rental for me. 
Um, then we have Blood Moon, Australian slasher, if I'm not mistaken. Had a DVD, never watched it. Now I probably have a VHS DVD, now a Blu-ray. Uh, look forward to finally watching this fucking thing. 1989, Blood Moon. We got the Mondo Macabro stuff. We have Special Silencers, 1982, Indonesian. Kind of horror action, if I'm not mistaken. Looks pretty cool. Digging uh, Mondo Macabro. Then we have, what is this one? Dr. Jekyll and the Werewolf, Paul Nashi here. 4K. Bizarre cover. This is just a slipcase, of course. And then what we have here is the Secrets and Mysteries films of Pedro Ole. There's two films here, Witness That Murder, and I can't think of the other one. Um, sorry about that. I, I don't remember the titles of, of them both are, but yeah, very cool. I, I'm familiar with them, but never seen them. Then we have a 4K of Death Squad, a.k.a. Brigade of Death, French movie. This movie's awesome. Nobody's ever seen this. I highly recommend checking this one out. Just uh, opens in an insanely brutal and violent moment. Uh, yeah, this is a great movie. This is an awesome fucking action movie. Highly recommended. Then last, we have Cat People on 4K. It was on sale a bit, so I'm doing 82 shortly, within a few months, maybe a little longer. But yeah, I might take a break. But Cat People, so pick that up on 4K. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Me.